today's episode of Getting to Know You. I'm your host, Cameron Edward Benton, and on today's episode, I have the great pleasure of introducing you to Christy Norman. Christy is one of my best friends, and she happens to be one of the best wine experts in the world. She's got over 27,000 followers on Instagram, huge following in the wine community, and she's probably one of the most powerful leaders I've ever met. Uh, she is someone who is constantly creating new things, building bigger things, and has an endless vision for the change that she actually wants to create in the world, and often, if not always, accomplishes her goal. Uh, she is the creator of the online wine course. She's been featured as uh, 40 Under 40 in Wine Enthusiast Magazine, as well as their Wine Educator of the Year. And she's currently the lead sommelier at Delilah's in Las Vegas, where they feature celebrities from all around the world with one of the most expensive and crazy wine lists uh, in the country. So without further ado, here is getting to know Christy Norman. So in today's show, we have wine enthusiast, wine educator of the year and 40 under 40, president of the United Sommelier Foundation, creator of the online wine course, and currently runs the wine program at Delilah Las Vegas, my great friend, Christy Norman. Christy, how are you doing today? Hi, Cameron. I'm so happy to be with you today. I'm happy that you're here with me as well. So Christy, you are just an incredible person. I mean, you really, really are. You're one of my absolutely best friends. You're someone I absolutely adore. And we started working together uh, at Spago back in 2017, I think it was. 2015. 2015. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you're right. I always forget how long ago that was now. Yup. So that has been seven, eight years now. That's crazy. That's been so long. And you were 21 years old and you came into Spago kind of like a rocket ship. You were working at, for your, your bodybuilding competition at the time. <laughs> And now you have just accomplished so much over these last uh, seven years from, you know, starting a charity organization to running the wine program at the Lila to, you know, being wine educator of the year, building up your Instagram following, selling t-shirts. You've done all these incredible things <laughs> and you have, you know, you're such a you know source of inspiration for me and joy for me to just get to, to witness you and, and be a part of that journey. And I'm, I'm curious, this is sort of just a very vague question, but like, where does all of that drive come from for you? I have no idea, to be honest. I actually, you showed me uh, this book called The Secret Language of Birthdays. And <laughs> do you remember the first yeah. time I was at your house and he showed uh -huh. me my birth birthday on this page and I didn't ever believe in zodiacs and stuff like that, but it April 28th is my birthday. And it said how motivated and like crazy, crazy motivated these people mm -hmm. are. And I don't know where it comes from. Like, I don't have anything to prove to anybody. I feel very happy and like fulfilled in my life, but it's just like, what's next? Like, there's always just like this thing, like, what else can mm -hmm. I create? Like, how big can I go? Like, what can I, you know, how many people can I impact? Mm -hmm. And I don't know why that is, but I've sort of believed in Zodiacs ever since. And I have the book now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and I think it's really fun to, um, I like to solve problems. I think that's mm. really the root of it. I like mm. to tackle tasks and learn different skills to be able to create whatever I'm trying to do. And, and mm -hmm. it's like, you just figure out, okay, here's one issue. And then, you know, you knock out that issue and then what's next and what's next. And it's really fun for me. And I think I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I love, it's like playing a game to me. Mm -hmm. And I just love it. So I think awesome. that's why, that's why I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm motivated, but I'm, I'm really like, I'm really inspired to do more, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What with wanting to do more, what's, what's next for you at this stage? Cause you've already accomplished so, so much. You are fairly young. You're, you have, you know, I feel like you could probably go anywhere and do anything like what, uh, where do you want to go right now? Like, what's your, what's your main focus? You know, I'm learning about NFTs in that space. I think it's a mm. really interesting concept that I'm personally exploring right now because I think that's really interesting. And mm. I think it's going to take over uh, the way that we live in mm. um, a few decades. That's just my personal belief. I'm just mm -hmm. learning about the technology and how it can be utilized and 
uh, it's it's really fascinating, like learning about blockchain. So that's mm. cool. Uh, but that's just an interest. I'm not like well versed on that at all by any yeah. means. But it's just something that's been piquing my interest lately. Um, right now, I'm running one of the biggest outlets in Las Vegas, and we're like doing record numbers for the hotel. You know, we were the biggest wine outlet uh, this year in 2022. Um, and I am not sure. I think it could be cool to run a hotel. I think it could be cool just to branch out and start doing more wine courses since that was really well received. Um, I have a couple mm -hmm. restaurant groups that are using it as training for lots of different restaurants. So even when I'm not posting about it, I'm, you know, courses are always <laughs> being taken, mm -hmm. uh, which is cool because, you know, my wine course is like a driver's ed course for beginners. And it truly is like a, uh, a step by step, it kind of takes you from not knowing anything about wine to being pretty well versed in wine with like quizzes mm -hmm. and there's worksheets with every video. And so when I meet somebody who's taken the wine course, it's amazing because <clears throat> it's like the switch that was turned on and like they understand wow. everything, but in a in a small way, but they understand concepts uh, really well. And so it's been really amazing to see and to meet people all over the world. Like I went to um, Eleven Madison Park. And the food runner that dropped my food said, I swear to God, this was so crazy. She was like, I'm here because of you. Like you mm. offered your wine course for free during the pandemic because I, I offered it for free uh, for like three or four months. And mm. I had thousands of people take it. I got 2000 emails in one day and it was the wow. most overwhelming thing. My DMs, like I would refresh it and it would just be like more, 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 like all wow. these people that were out of work. Um, and she dropped my food and she said that I was she had got hired because of her wine knowledge. When you say she dropped her... your food, she, did she like drop it on the oh, floor no, no, and then she, she like actually she, dropped it off? That's like a restaurant term. So she right. dropped <laughs> off my food to me. Okay. She I was friends with some of the Psalms that worked there and she said, like I'm here because of you and you, you know, I took your wine course and I learned so much about wine and that's why, you know, I got this job. Mm -hmm. And we both started like crying at the bar with strangers and the bartender, like observing this. And it was crazy. <laughs> I'm a big, wow. you know, I, I'm a, I, I cry in public quite yeah. often when stuff like that happens. I just can't <laughs> handle it. Like it was such a cool moment because, you know, I was just sitting there giving at first, I did it really inefficiently where I sent out like thousands of promo codes that were unique and I was sending them that way. And then I just started doing them in batches mm. and I told people that it expired after two weeks. It actually didn't. I've never actually told anybody <laughs> that it never expires, but I would tell people it did because there was a really high completion rate. And yeah. it was at the time with those free courses, it was like 95% completion. It was crazy. Wow. And like people would actually email me being like, oh my gosh, I forgot. Can you please unlock it for me so that I can keep yeah. going? And I was like, yeah, sure. No problem. It's done. And like, I <laughs> didn't do anything. But you know, hilarious. it was really great to get people to actually finish because you know the comprehensive exam was really difficult and it would it like shuffles the questions and adds other yeah. questions. And yeah. so, you know, you can't cheat, you know, you actually have to do the work <laughs> to pass mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was, that was really amazing. Uh, Cause it was mm. just so much work for me to do and like managing like all these thousands of people. Cause like, if I went back and did it again, I would create a separate email address. Like I would mm. not. And, and I actually learned how to do a bunch of stuff during that time. Like I, I learned how to reply on Instagram. There's like these quick codes. So if you're getting the, if you're hmm. responding to the same type of message, like I made it. So it, when you typed H it filled out, it had like the form uh, and all that stuff. So I would just nice. press H for everybody. And it was really great. But I had no, I, I was like, I'm really glad I'm not a celebrity with millions of followers. Cause it was so overwhelming. Like I just totally had a breakdown yeah, when yeah. that happened. I did not, I only dropped it into like five hospitality groups online it was a place in Chicago. There's one in New York. Uh, these were Facebook groups. Uh, and then in, and then on my personal and it just like grew yeah. like rapidly. It was crazy. So how many people have taken the online wine course at this point? Uh, probably about 20,000. That is amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely incredible. Yeah. I've, I, I've had uh, people take it in 40 countries actually 40 countries they must all speak english but uh <laughs> when i would like ship pins all the time from my house i had 
it was so cool because I just had all of these countries that I was like, how? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I realized, okay, if, as long as you speak English, I guess you could do it. But it was pretty cool yeah. uh, just to see where all of the courses were going and who was taking it and stuff like that. It was amazing. Yeah. And, and for context for the the audience, when you're talking about shipping pins, you mean like the, the little like sort of victory pin that they got once they completed the course? Yeah. So once you pass, there's a certificate and pin that you'll get. But obviously mm -hmm. for the free ones, I I didn't do that. I said like, no, you're not going to get me to ship pins for everybody because uh, that yeah. would have just been too much. And I'm glad that I did that because it would have been insane. Seven nuts. I, if people that really wanted to buy the pin, I made it available for like 10 bucks. Mm, that's cool. Yeah. So they could, they could have it. Some people were like really obsessed with it. And so I made it available like one or two times and it was crazy. We had like, mm. I sent hundreds of pins out. It was really, really, really cool. Wow. Wow. And so one of the things I wanted to ask about with the, the online course, cause this is actually really fascinating. I don't know. Have you studied much about like success rates with online courses and stuff? No. Okay. So most online courses when they're created, they have like, a 95% of the people don't ever complete them, which is nuts because you're like, I actually have like a 90% completion rate, which is crazy. Uh, I wouldn't say 90% overall. Okay. Right, right. I would not say 90% overall. I was saying specifically for those people that I <laughs> sent that, that promo code to, and I told right. them that it, cause like those were real mm -hmm. people. It wasn't yeah, yeah. like bots, right? That yeah, were yeah. asking for a free code. Like these were humans that are like, I'm not doing anything at the right, time. Right. I, but I have course completions. I don't know what the actual percentage is. I've never actually mm -hmm. looked, but yeah. it's pretty high. I mean, I have so many people that have completed the course. It's kind of insane. That's cool. And it's not that long. I mean, it's like three hours if you put all of the videos together, but it's mm -hmm. in 16 different sections. Yeah. So there's like four or five videos in each section, like explaining a concept. And then there's a quiz at the end of the video. It's like a checkpoint. Right. And then at the very end, there's the the final exam. Got so. it. Cool. 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 Yeah. Well, the reason that I that I brought that up and was was curious about it is because one of the things you made me think of was it could be like a really good idea for people who create online courses which are obviously a big thing to maybe because a lot of them are created in such a way where it's like, oh, you buy the course and you have unlimited access to it. And while I think that that's like in thought is like a good idea, right? It creates that same problem of, well, I can complete it whenever. And so it like never gets done. Part of what you're making me think of is like, I wonder if it would be more effective to create. So it's like if you bought a, I don't know, a six week course, say you have eight weeks to complete it. And you get unlimited access to it, but only if you complete it within those eight weeks, right? Like find some way of like, how do I get people to have this sort of like urgency to actually complete it? Because it's, you know, I've thought about creating different online courses. I know a lot of people who create courses in the space. And I think it's one of the sort of dissatisfying aspects of it is like, well, I can create this thing and I have an intention of it helping people, but it, you know, maybe doesn't in, in practicality. Yeah. One of my mentors is a wine professor for UCLA. Mm -hmm. And when I was going over the course material with him, he said, what do they get at the end? Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I don't know. What do you mean? And he's like, mm -hmm. you got to give them something. And that's why I did the certificate and the pin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people hang it up on their walls and they send it to me. <laughs> they send photos and stuff. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty yeah. Amazing. That's great. That's super cool. I, I love that idea. Yeah, what did they get in the end? That's a, that's a big one. I was just at a storytelling workshop and one of the things that they talked about there was this, the importance of when you're telling a story to have a payoff, right? So have the, well, what do you get in the end for essentially listening to it? It's like, why did I ramble about whatever story I did? Uh, so you get this point. Awesome. Well, any, I'm curious, cause you, you obviously, you created the wine course out of, you know, really crazy time in your life. If I remember correctly, you had a lot going on uh, and you were accomplishing a lot of different things and you were basically funneling, you know, every ounce of money you had to go and create this thing for people who are wanting to create their own, you know, online course or do that type of thing. Do you have any, any advice, any tips, any like pieces of wisdom that you gain from that process? Don't build custom like I did. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? So you can use different platforms to create online courses. Mm. I wanted things very, very particularly, and it cost me a lot of money, but <laughs> it was worth it now. 
but it was incredibly expensive for the mm. web maintenance and like you just need to have a really solid web team if you want something really custom like I did like for instance mm. I didn't want people to be able to skip to different videos I mm. only wanted I wanted quiz music to play like while they were taking the quiz and all my music was made by a DJ that's an mm. EDM DJ and he made it based on the the playlist that I was listening to and then also to carry through certain themes. So there's like difficult sections that have like music that puts you at ease. And the, hmm. there's this, this music for the quizzes and it's like a very gentle clock. It's very hmm. gentle. Uh, but if you listen to it, it's, it's pretty cool how he did that. And I wanted all of these very custom features and I didn't have a dev team at the beginning that was great at communicating with me. So I learned how to work with developers and now I have like a really amazing team with a liaison that like really understands me and what I'm asking for. Mm -hmm. And I also realized that people that are in the dev space, a lot of times like web dev specifically, they're programmers, right? So they are used to if this, then that mm -hmm. like methods of communication. And I think right. it's made me a much more clear delegator and communicator because mm -hmm. Instead of writing a long sentence, I say, when this, then that, right? When someone mm. clicks on this, I want it to look like this, right? Mm. And uh, it's, it's, it was very difficult at the beginning. Uh, mm. It was very, very difficult. But, you know, it, t it takes trials and tribulations. And, you know, now it can go anywhere, right? It was, yeah. it was very challenging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So when you say that it was difficult, was it specifically just the communication and adjusting to a different style of, of communication than you were used to at the time? Or what was it that made it difficult? I didn't understand anything about web development. I had mm. no idea what was needed, what to ask for, what things to look for in a developer. So we probably went through five or six people after we launched mm. just to be able to, to, to get to a place where everything is working because think about it every six months mm. there are plugins that get outdated mm. there's uh, constantly the threat of having uh, cyber attacks like it was so funny uh, on one of my it was a form it was so weird it was on form that was like to get information about the course like it wasn't it wasn't our emails but there was an outside like bot because we didn't have like mm. one of those like robo you know check that you're not a, captcha a robot things. captcha yeah. there we go that's what i was trying to say so if you don't <laughs> have one of those then a random bot can start putting in random email addresses because it wasn't ours it was like an oh, wow. external database and then they were sending and you get like a receipt email and so it was like sending some weird stuff about like ca canadian stuff i don't know it was like canadian mm. weirdness yeah so like Weird having something like that happen and you're like, holy shit, why is my email sending 10,000 emails to email addresses that I don't have on file? And then having to have a dev team that works quickly that to just like fix it, put a recaptcha and it's done, right? Yeah. But yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a process for sure. And yeah. you know, if somebody, and then I love this, when you have that many people using the course at the same time, you have somebody that's like, it's not working and they are like freaking out. And then it's mm. actually like their Wi-Fi. Or it's like their device that like, so this was the, my favorite thing. I had to change it. I had to change like the layout of the course because people didn't scroll up. So they didn't see that all of the videos were there. And like, that's a, that's a me problem. Right. But, and, right. but it was so funny because there was like a bunch of people at the time that were like, there's no videos. Rah, rah, rah. And I'm like, they're hitting me up on like every platform. Like it's crazy. Like when, when people are ready to learn about wine, like they're ready right now yeah. and they yeah. want it immediately. Like if there's any issues, like I know about it and our team and, and I'm very responsive, like I see everything. So it's not that hard, Yeah. but when, and a lot, most people don't provide any information or a screenshot of anything either. So yeah. it's like, I have to go and guess what the F is happening. Yeah. And I just have to be like, team, please investigate. <laughs> just pray yeah. that they figure it out. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I love that story of like, right. If just something as simple as because you don't see it on the front page and think to scroll down, which might seem like a mate for you. Right. <laughs> people are like freaking out, like losing yeah. their mind, like angry, mm -hmm. like, 
you know, and when people are paying, like, obviously, you want to make sure that everything's working and functional and stuff. So Mm -hmm. it was very stressful. It's a different type of stress, because I couldn't fix it. Like everything I had done in the past, it's like, you know, if I'm creating something or, you know, posting about something Mm. or whatever, like I'm in control of the content. Whereas like for web stuff, I am not in control of the content as much as I would like to pretend to be. I'm at the mercy of my dev team and how good they are, you know? Yeah. And that's like, like sort of a great lesson from like a leadership standpoint, right? Of like, you know, when you are expanding, like you, you're not going to be in control of all these different little pieces, right? So it's like being able to be like, hey, there's this thing and like being able to sort of be that in-between person that can then communicate to the the developer to then fix that as quickly as possible and make sure that they, they even understand what the issue is and everything. Yes. Yeah. If there is an issue, because sometimes people believe that there are issues that don't exist. <laughs> which probably gives you some more patience with like IT people, I'm sure. Cause I know that there's been several times for myself where I'm like, Oh, there's this issue with this thing. And like, no, I tried doing that thing. And then I go do it again. And I'm like, no, it was just, you know, me being dumb. <laughs> yes, precisely. <Yeah. laughs> Very cool. Well, I think that's a, a great jumping up off point to um, this other question that I want to ask you about, which is, I think you've had this great ability to, for lack of a better word, to create, something out of nothing uh, over and over again. You know, for a lot of people when they're going through their career, I think it's very easy to sort of go from job to job. I mean, it's more or less like climb the corporate ladder, if you will, and whatever that ladder might look to them. It's in the restaurant industry, it looks one way, then, you know, marketing agencies, it looks a different way. Um, but for you, you have always done this thing where it's like, you find the right people, you have an idea, and then you find a way to like make it happen. You know, whether it's the online wine course, whether it's the um, the wine tasting group that's in L.A. or the, you know, the United Psalm Foundation, uh, United Psalm A Foundation. I'll say that one more correctly for you this time. <laughs> like you I had was coaching ma- him on yeah. how to say that. Yeah, I had to, I got, I got reprimanded earlier, so I had to make sure I didn't write this one. It wasn't a reprimand. I just wanted to make people comfortable. It's yeah, uncomfortable yeah, that, to say the word sommelier. Like some people feel like really insecure about it. So that's fair. I, I did, I did work in restaurants for a while though. I used to say sommelier. That's true. That's true. That's a, a fair true. amount of times. I know it's been a while, but I am so there. So yeah, I, I'm curious, like when you, maybe I should just ask a really vague question. Like, how do you do it? Like, how do you create something out of nothing? Well, maybe six, seven years ago, Cameron Bent, Cameron Edward Benton called me and said, what do you really want to do? And does that make you happy? And for those of you who don't know, Cameron is who I consider like my angel of my life because he was the first person to ever ask me what I really wanted to do and, and what value that brought to my life. And, and he listened and he enrolled me into a couple different programs now that really got to uncover the trauma (laughs) that I have, that I had, that I stuffed away so that I was able to deal with it and become a happier, fulfilled person who goes after their dreams you know, and, and really identify what happiness is for me, instead of the idea of happiness that I thought I should have. And so I think that's part of it. I, I have done a lot of things now that the muscle of blind confidence just kind of works. And I think I'm a pretty logical person. Uh, I'm, I'm authentic to people. So when I'm requesting support, I'm not beating around the bush. I'm saying I need support. And I know that out of the pool of 300 wine professionals or so that I have personally touched in my career, either as a mentor or a friend and acquaintance, as an employee, as you know, whatever, I trust that at least 10 people would show up for me at any given time for any project that I have, right? No matter how big or small. And I think when you make people feel seen and feel like they matter and that they make a difference, they want to be involved no matter what it is. And it's like, you know, really being grounded in what the vision is that I'm trying to create. It's like when I started my tasting group, it wasn't to start a tasting group. A tasting group is something that you 
you get to do as a wine professional. And it's not just like sitting around and drinking. It's studying a very specific skill called blind tasting in which imagine like you just walk into a room and this is the exam for some of the higher sommelier certifications. A bunch of different certifications do this, almost all. And you have wines that are pre-poured in the glass, white and red. And you have to determine what the variety is, the vintage, so the year of the wine that the wine was made, the, the where it comes from, the country, the region. Like you have to be able to logically deduce and accurately deduce what is in the glass in front of you with no with without any help. And it's a very, very specific skill. And I, I didn't go into it thinking, oh, well, you know, it'd be cool to have a little tasting group. I was like, no, I'm dreaming of a world that everyone can be part of this amazing tasting group. You split the cost of wine, so it's lower cost. I'll invite amazing mentors and masters to come every single month so that we have like a rotating mentorship. Because a lot of times what happens is you get a group of your peers together and you're all arguing because, and you're not really learning anything from one another because you're all just regurgitating the same things. So it's like, yeah. how could, how could I create this mechanism so that I have amazing mentors coming to mentor every month for, and you're getting this like brand new set of brain power, you know, from a different region of the country. They have different descriptors when they're talking about wine, they have different philosophies, they have different tips for exams, stuff like that. And, you know, be able to create this amazing vision. And people said, yes. You know, of course, um, you know, when I created the the charity, when I co-founded it with Chris Blanchard, who's a master psalm, you know, we didn't just think, you know, oh, let's, let's just do something to, to help. It was like, okay, you know, let's give out a million dollars. And we've done that in grants. Like we've raised 1.5 mil and given out 1.3. Like as soon as it went in, it went out. And at the beginning, we didn't have enough money uh, when the pandemic hit and all the wine professionals lost their job. Everyone was getting laid off. And the Psalms were really the first thing to go. Because when you have a restaurant, you need a server, you need a busser, you need a dishwasher, but you don't need a sommelier. And we felt that sommeliers in the restaurant were the most vulnerable, but our funding also extended to other, you know, different um, types of jobs, essentially, Yeah. in the wine space as, that are sommeliers. But it, it was it was really incredible because once we shared and I've, I have a great platform in the wine industry, I'm, I'd consider myself a very micro influencer in the regular space. But in the wine space, I feel like I have a lot of genuine connections that are also fortified by the Internet. <laughs> and so, uh, I'm you know, when we share things that are important to to me and to the community and stuff like that, I feel like. I've attracted a lot of people that are very like-minded and are happy to amplify that message. So we have a really big megaphone, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, we need to support and strengthen the sommelier community because there's a lot of things that, you know, there's a lot of things that the wine industry hasn't had. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a quick example. There are tons of scholarships and trips opportunities for psalms to like go and travel to a region but there wasn't a single organization that i ever knew of that would give you five hundred dollars for gas right or like if you're if your restaurant burned down to pay your rent yeah like we do that hmm. and that didn't exist and and actually when the pandemic hit i had you know i had applied for funding from every like restaurant workers really fund like every single one but there was nothing specifically earmarked for the wine community and we spend mm. thousands and thousands of dollars to own our craft and a lot of them are yeah. paid as like servers are or less right, right? it's not yeah. like at spago i was making a lot less than the servers at the time right. you know and mm -hmm. and it's not like that i was complaining i had an amazing experience but in just in terms of like the importance of wine of, of wine professionals, you know, we, we just wanted to create something that could support and strengthen the community. That was not an educational resource about wine because mm -hmm. there's plenty of wine books and there's plenty of scholarships that you can go on and stuff like that. And lots of trips. And not that I'm not grateful for the trips that I have been given or the scholarships mm -hmm. that I have received, but it's just like, 
you know, we're whole and complete people. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you know, we're not just fact reading machines, you know, what about leadership? What about personal development? What about financial literacy? Those are things that I, I care about that I care about for my SOM community, because, you know, for so long, I mean, I've done all these master classes. So we talk about a region and, you know, we have a famous winemaker that presents or a national director of sales and all these amazing high wine people, you know, people that are in these amazing positions speaking about their products and whatnot. And it's so cool and fascinating to learn. And I love that aspect of my life, but I also understand that there's a great need. And, you know, I, 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 we have all of our applications uh, made anonymous. So I can't see anyone's name, restaurant, anything that would tell me about where they lived. But when I vote, it's, it can be very jarring because it's like, you know, our administrative directors, like these, this is a vetted sommelier, you know, at, X, Y, and Z, you know, in, in a, a, let's say a state, if it, if it matters, let's say like they're affected by hurricane or this is vetted, like their restaurant burned down, like all this stuff, you know, um, there's a lot more instances of that than you think that aren't as highly publicized. Like it has happened several times. And so it's made me also very in touch with crisis and, Hmm. you know, I'm, you know, paying attention a lot more to, the economy and what's going on, you know, there's a building collapse in New York. Well, does that affect anybody? Right. There's like, it's, yeah. like, it's, it's really interesting uh, how, how having or being part of the organization really has shifted my perspective. And it's very difficult to read some of the applications, especially when you know that these are vetted circumstances and whatnot. Uh, but ultimately I think we've done something that's really good and something that I think will last for a really long time. That's, that's really, really cool. I mean, thank you for, for sharing all that. I think just, it's, it's so cool to hear how, I mean, not only have you know the impact of these people, but it's given you the sort of broader like world perspective, right. On just how they are. Cause I, I can imagine, right. It's like, I think about mostly sommeliers in LA or Vegas or, you know, these big, top places but there are sommeliers in ohio and in you know you know pittsburgh alaska alaska there's tons tons of psalms in alaska (laughs) i had no idea i had no idea and we've actually awarded a psalm in every state in the u.s wow really cool yeah that was that's amazing it was so cool yeah and i mean i was never paying attention to that stuff but you know when when we did a recap because at the beginning like we just had just tons and tons and tons of applications, you know, and, and going through the trials and tribulations, like when our, our PayPal account would like lock us out and the the Zelle account would lock us out because we were paying people, you know, instantaneously, which was awesome. But also it was like causing all these banking, like triggering issues where it was just like locking us out. And like, we would have to go into the branch physically. Oh, Mm -hmm. that must've been such a pain to deal with, you know, for the treasurer and, (laughs) I, I just, I can't, you know? Yeah. So I'm curious, do you know what the last state was? That was funded? Yeah. No. We awarded somebody like a, like two days ago, but I have okay. no idea what state they live in. All right. No, I was I just curious. No clue. Yeah, because it, <laughs> it was all anonymized, so I really have no yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I'm just curious if you happen to know it. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a, a million things I, I want to ask you about from them. I guess with, yeah, I, yeah, I guess that, that's that's one thing I'm, I'm curious about is, have you ever seen Mr. Beast? Are you familiar with him? Mm-mm. No. So he's like the number one creator on YouTube, like outside of like music channels and that kind of stuff. He's kind of has like the number one channel. He created, you might have even seen it. He created the like, um, basically a real life version of Squid Game that like, people play it and it's like 10 minutes and basically releases like a viral video that hits like you know 50 million plus every uh every week if if not um higher than that um so he's a huge guy i've been like kind of obsessed with him lately just listening to a bunch of podcasts that he's been on he's like 24 or something like that now and he's just like solely like kind of dedicated to this mission but He's also very driven to like help people. And a lot of this content is about like, oh, like if I just give people money, you know, like one of his first things that he ever went sort of viral ish about his first brand deal was actually he was given $5,000 for his brand deal. And he was like, 
no, make it $10,000 and I'll give it to a homeless person and I'll film it and it'll go big. And so he did that at like 21 or something like that and goes off and gives it to him, blows up all over the internet. And that's like kind of his thing. So a lot of his stuff is, you know, if you do this, I'll give you half a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or lots of ways to win money or give money away to different people. And he released a, a, a recent video that was just a day or two ago that was curing, uh, let's see if I can get the number right. It was either 20,000 or 2000, I think it's 20,000 people of blindness in like a day. And it, it's like seeing that, seeing the kind of stuff that you do, I'm, I'm like inspired more and more about this idea of really being help, being able to help people directly. Cause I think to your point with the, the sommeliers and I think, and I think there's a lot of organizations and by organizations, I didn't mean just like a single business, but sort of like collectives of cultures where it's like, we do these scholarship things, these things that are kind of designed to help these higher level things, but we're not taking care of people at these like base levels, right? It's like, we can have a scholarship for higher learning, but people just don't have enough money for food <laughs> um, or don't have enough money for housing or these basic kind of needs. And it's, a lot of his work and the work that you're doing has brought my my eyes and my attention to that kind of thing where I think there's so much more that we can be doing to help people at this base level. And while I love, you know, Elon Musk sort of shooting for Mars and, you know, in his own way, I don't know, it's brought me to a lot more groundedness to the sense of, I guess, the the sort of immediate and current needs of actual people in this actual moment, rather than always striving for something to be bigger and greater. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I mean, you could, you could go even further down, right? In terms of like, you know, well, you're not actually helping the people on the ground. You know, what if, mm. you know, just giving $500 means nothing. Actually, there was someone who was like, pretty prominent on the internet they were extremely angry at our organization because very when new orleans had you know had the hurricane and it was devastated we opened up funding for the hurricane and we were um, paying people virtually so that you know let's say that someone had to evacuate from their home you know, maybe the money would help them get a hotel or something like that. And we had funds that were instantaneously transferred. But this person, you know, said, well, you got, why aren't you guys funneling money towards a mutual aid agency and stuff like that? Right. So it's, it's like, there's always two sides of the coin. And I think like on the one hand, I think scholarships are an amazing thing, right? Like not bashing any of the scholarship programs that there are. It's just that in terms of like types of support, we just didn't have anything that was earmarked for the community. And I think, you know, it's something I think about all the time, you know, and, and, you know, are we really helping people? You know, um, I think in a lot of cases we are, you know, in, in certain situations, it's like, you know, someone's mom just passed away and, you know, they got behind on bills because they were paying so much, so many Ubers to the hospital. Right. And then they just got behind or whatever, you know, having uh, situations you know, like that, I, I think that, you know, what am I trying to say? Like, I think there, there should be different types of organizations to touch people in different ways. Right. That's what I'm trying to say. Like there's, you know, mutual aid and crisis organizations that are like boots on the ground. And then there's, you know, other levels, but what that person didn't understand is that we couldn't legally just donate our money that we received as a 501c3 and just give it to people that are on the ground donating food. Like we can't do that legally. Mm, right. And, and right. some people don't understand that. Right. Yeah. Some people don't understand like that there are rules <laughs> on, <laughs> on what you could do. Right. And yeah. you know, I, I've really gotten woken up to uh, the different laws for, you know, nonprofits and, and what's allowed and what's not. And um, it's an entire different universe that I was not used to. And I think, you know, we've done a really good job uh, navigating all of those things, but it it has come with challenges, you know, and I think that person honestly was the only person I've ever known that's been upset at us over anything. And I just thought it was funny because it was like, we're not, a, we're not an organization that like hands out food, like, you know, flies there and, you know, passes out emergency kits. Like that's not what we do. And it wouldn't be uh, fair to the people who have donated or legal, I think, to actually do that right yeah to do something different than what you said mm -hmm. that makes sense are there 
are there places or ways that you're hoping to give, um, let's say differently or give more uh, with the United Sommelier Foundation and just being able to, uh, is there a way that you're wanting to expand that further from where it is right now? Yeah, well, we're actually teeing up uh, a really large scholarship program around our core values. So I, I don't want to announce what those things are yet, but there's some really, really big brands that have committed or they're trying to get the funds to have a scholarship program that's not based on it's not based on how much you know. It's not based on what you're learning. So for instance, like I'll share this one example because this isn't probably my favorite one, but there's an innovation scholarship, you know, that we're we're talking about. And like how cool would it be to win an award and also win some money for how you're revolutionizing the wine industry? We have never put focus on people that are creating in the industry. It's always been about people who are doing the thing where it's like, you know, oh, I'm running a wine program that has 3000 selections. Like, that's cool. But like, I'm also really interested in the person who is like trapping CO2 emissions that are emitted during you know, the winemaking process and turning it into electricity or something, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm That's a great point. That. How cool is that, right? And so I mm -hmm. think it will be really cool because it'll also, I think, give people an avenue to be unique and be different. You know, when I was coming up, I felt like, you know, it was not good to be an, an influencer or, um, you know, have a social media presence. It was very, very conservative, I will say. Mm -hmm. The industry was very conservative. I was somebody who was like very controversial uh, <laughs> at the time because I would like post pictures of myself in a dress and, and show <laughs> my legs. And like that was really offensive to people in the industry. It's very conservative, wow. you know, and yeah. I get it. And um, people have been afraid to branch out. And I've had so many women, I can't even tell you, like message me and say like, hey, like I'm sharing these videos of me roller skating because, you know, I was inspired by you. And I was like, wow, like that's so cool. Like you feel comfortable as a person like in your 40s or 50s, let's say, like feeling comfortable sharing your joy, which like everyone, nobody felt like they could share their joy a long time ago. And I was always like, fuck it, you know, <laughs> like, uh, I'm just going to make an embarrassing rap video yeah. where I'm wearing pleather and eating caviar. Oh my gosh, I totally forgot about that whole that thing. That you're in that video. It's my favorite <laughs> I video. forgot about oh that. I am gosh. in that. Yeah, I hope you link uh, that video somehow on this I, podcast. I will, so people can I'll watch. have to, yeah. I'll definitely yeah, Cameron have to link is, it. Cameron has a cameo in my first ever rap music video, which oh I just gosh. wanted to be like over, over the top in every sense. I just wrote this rap in like in an hour. It took like an hour. And then I sent it to my DJ friend and he was like re-recorded at 1 30 BPM. And I was like, okay, cool. Or whatever it was. And, um, and he just sent it back and he's like, yeah, can you do, you know, like the little Migos thing where you're like, you're like, yeah. Like I said, random. <laughs> and I was just like, and I sent an entire track just of that. And oh, then he so came funny. back and it was like, so fire. It was amazing. And then I was like, I have to do a video. To this. That is this hilarious! Is like I, ridiculous. I had completely forgotten about that video until you just mentioned it. So Dude, your face you when, they, when we zoom in on your face, <laughs> it's like the best moment of the whole video. Um, the whole the intention of the video is, um, so I, I I googled and I was watching a YouTube video that was like how to write a rap, and the person was like, every number one rap song has to do with a struggle. So what do you what do you absolutely struggle with in whatever situation that you're in. So I was like, I was like, when people drink expensive Cabernet, which is a red wine with thick skins and tannin with caviar, which is really expensive. And it mixes with the fish oils and creates a nasty precipitate and it actually makes it taste bad in your mouth. And it's like this one thing that I'm like, Oh, like every time you go to a seafood restaurant, and all these people have caviar, and then they're drinking like a $2,000 bottle that that has a bunch of like red wine that does not go well with it at all. And it actually produces a nasty flavor. So I made a video about that. Yeah. I decided to write a rap about that struggle. <laughs> <laughs> Lil Samsi. Lil Samsi is my gangster rap name. Yeah, we will definitely have to link link to that video in this. Uh... Yeah, yeah Cameron's performance sure. is incredible. He had hair back oh, then on his I head, did, on the top. On, on the top of my head up here <laughs> where there is no more hair. That, that, is, that ship has sailed.
So one of the things you mentioned earlier was you had mentioned like, well, I guess one of the profound impacts that it had on you was just feeling seen and heard and how that kind of allowed you to, to grow. And I feel like that's something that I, I hear from a lot of other people is that, you know, that importance of being seen and heard that you've made an impact on them on, or you've had a ton of people that have come up to you and been like, oh yeah, like you've made such a big difference in my life for X, Y, Z thing, whether it's the tasting group or it's the wine course, or it's the United Sommelier Foundation or, you know, whatever it might be, you're somebody who constantly has an ability to make somebody feel very seen. What are, for lack of a better word, I was gonna say what, find a nice way to say it, but like, how do you do that? Like, what, what are, what are some ways that you, you actively or consciously use to make sure somebody actually feels uh, seen and heard and not just, I don't know, bypassed? Well, I believe that everybody has value and, what I discovered through the transformational process really that I, that I went through without sounding too hippie, you know, I, I realized that most all men, I completely like didn't feel comfortable having an intimate connection with them. Uh, that was a huge discovery for me because one half of the population, I was unconsciously refusing to have Um, a deeper conversation or deeper meaning. And I think that stemmed from the, my, my lack of self-worth in terms of like thinking that if if I, if I share myself to a man, what if he's interested in me and I am not able to fend him off. Right. Or then I would have to get into the uncomfortable situation of rejecting him. Whereas now I'm very comfortable rejecting speaking my mind I'm very comfortable telling somebody if they've crossed a line or they're making me uncomfortable. Whereas when I, before I did not have enough self-esteem to feel comfortable doing that. And so I would just not put myself in the situation by being very impersonal with like 50% of the population. So that was a huge discovery, but also just actually listening and being okay, not looking good. And having, not worrying about my self-image so much, right? I think there's always moments though where you're like, oh my gosh, I got something on my shirt or whatever, but like just, you know, carrying on, like who the fuck cares, right? Yeah. I, I don't care. And, and, you know, I think it's better when somebody is super authentic and it's just like, I feel so uncomfortable right now. Like I am so nervous. You make me so nervous. I've been so excited to meet you or whatever. Like, I love that. I love that energy instead of someone like trying to be cool and like trying Mm. to be whatever. It's just, yeah, here I am, you know, and I, I want people to feel comfortable around me. And I, and I love seeing the parts of people that maybe weren't obvious at the beginning. Like something I love to ask, like my couple friends when I go hang out with them, for instance, my great friend, Caster, you know, I, I will ask their spouse, like, what's something about them that I don't, I might not know. Mm-hmm. And I learned that my friend flies simulator airplanes and like would fly like long distances and be like, oh, I'm going to Narita this morning. <laughs> it's like, and, and he like actually could land a plane if like, it's like, it's like a pilot testing simulator grade where he could actually do it. Like it has all the little things. And, you know, so really discovering things about people, um, about what they're passionate about, what they like. I feel like that makes me feel seen when people are curious about more than just what's on the surface. Yeah. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, from what I heard, it's right. It's you're being curious about somebody, right. And like being genuinely curious about someone and, and willing to listen and, also breaking past the for lack of a better word the, the bullshit right the that initial image that that covering that we often wear to feel protected and honestly it was i think one of the things that i admired um and still admire most about you when i think about you at you know at spago you know in any of these sort of fine dining establishments it can often feel like it's easy to you have to put on some sort of a, a front, right? Because there's a, a way things are, especially if you go to older, more older school um, restaurants, there's this kind of wall, this, this you know, way that things are done. And I think you always had this great ability to, to not care. 
and to be authentic and be yourself in these different ways that allowed you to actually create all these other connections that you're talking about, right? Because you weren't worried about like impressing somebody or not impressing somebody or doing things. Not that you wouldn't care. It's like, oh, that's a VIP. I got to take care of them and, you know, know who somebody is to like do the right thing by them and, you know, build the relationship. But to say at the end of the day, you're going to show up authentically and let the cards where they lie. And I think it's been such an inspiring part of yourself. Is that something you've, you've always to a certain degree had, or is that something you developed consciously over time? No, it was definitely something that like was worked on in, in, in great detail because, you know, when you're doing these leadership programs as Cameron, you know, very well, since you've gone through some of the same programs, mm-hmm. uh, you, you don't get to hide, you know, mm-hmm. you can't hide. And it's so much easier to like say what you mean the first time instead of like getting hounded by the person or whatever. It's just like being direct and 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 being really focused and like and specific. Mm-hmm. I think people are afraid to be specific sometimes because they don't want things to fail. But mm-hmm. I'm like a uh, I like to call myself like a shift master where you know, if something doesn't work, like you just try something else and you're like, okay, off that, that's not going to work. So like, how do we get there? Okay, let's try this way. Oh, that's not going to work. Right. And you just figure it out and you just start pivoting over and over. And, you know, it takes a lot of, uh, I I think being authentic all the time just makes life easier because if I had to wear a mask based on every single person in relationship, like I used to, like, it's exhausting. It's like, oh, I have to be like the perfect you know, employee or whatever, or, or friend, or I have to be this perfect girlfriend or whatever. Like, that's just tiring. It's just like such emotional energy. And anytime I feel like a person wants me to be a certain way, and like, they admonish me for like my isms, I like get myself out of that. I don't, I don't want to spend time with that person. And it's nothing personal. It's just like, I'm not whatever you made up in your mind. And like, you're going to see this. And if you're not cool with this, then I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go you know? Yeah. And that's, I don't know. I think that's been a lot easier just in general because I'm already tired from all the stuff that I'm doing. Why do I want my relationships to make me tired? You know, (laughs) that's a great point. Yeah. You're already uh, quite the busy. I'm doing so much stuff. Like why do I'm not going to like coddle you or like, you know, I mean, I think like, you know, you can be nice to somebody and you can give feedback in a way that, you know, they will be receptive to. But if somebody's going to, you know, have um, emotional outbursts or something as a friend or as a partner or whatever, like I'm just not mm-hmm. into any of that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. What, what are, what are qualities that you look for in, um, when <laughs> I say this, what are qualities that you look for in like, what am I trying to say? What are qualities that you look for in mentors or in people who are leading you, right? Because I think you're you're such a person who is always giving and leading in so many different ways. Yet I know that you've also you know had the opportunity to learn from really great people and be under people and being a great leader and as I would say vocal as you are, you know, it can be, I would say challenging to be in a situation where it's like, you don't have great leadership. It's like, oh God, I got to deal with this guy. So what are, what are the qualities that you continue to look for in, in people that you're, you know, working for, working with? That's a, that's a tough one. I think that I try and learn from as many people as possible, even if they're bad examples. Hmm. So it, it, when you're talking about like people I seek out to be a mentor, I mean, it's usually when they have a skill set that I just don't have at all. And I just really want to learn. Like for instance, last February, I, said I was feeling really bored at work. And so the executive wine director said, well, do you want to learn from me? And uh, so we've had a coaching session together, you know, like almost every other week, sometimes we Mm -hmm. skip, but like, that's been really interesting just to learn about something that's much bigger than myself, you know, in a big organization and just like understanding how the wheels turn. Mm -hmm. That's unique. But I think also uh, a mentor that is open to, different ways of, of things getting done. Um, someone who cares, uh, I think caring is the most important thing. You know, the, you know, I always joked with with my old boss at Spago, how he was never a good mentor to me. And I wanted him to like teach me stuff. And like now looking back, I actually talked to him on the phone recently and I was like, 
you taught me a lot of stuff about relationships and how to deal with people. And now I understand why you were talking to all these suppliers for like, what do you seem like forever? Like, I just like, I needed you for something and you were just talking and talking. And, mm -hmm. and now I understand like what the key to the industry and, and relationships is and like mm -hmm. being your word and, you know, say, if you don't like something, just say it like, Hey, it's not for me. Don't like string people along. Right. Like mm -hmm. all of those were such important lessons. And, you know, I think mentor mentee relationships are, are so important, but they're also, you know, they change, they change and that's okay. And, and, you know, there's people who I used to consider mentors that, you know, will always still be my mentors in some way, but they're not the people that I'm actively like learning from anymore. And I think the more mentors that you have, the better. So even if they suck at a lot of things, it's like, okay, like I won't do that. Like that would be mm. cool. You yeah. know? Yeah. I, I think it's really amazing. And I, I think it's really cool too, to, to, to manage up and to look at the people above you and give them feedback too, because they know that you're coming from the right place. Like someone who's given to you wholeheartedly and, you know, given you all these tools to succeed and they're telling you something's not working. Like, mm -hmm. you know, most of my mentors have been like, wow, thank you. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that that's a huge one that you're, you're catching on and something that I've noticed within uh, good organizations and one in organizations that are maybe not run so well is, is that ability is that not even that ability to receive feedback from people who are quote unquote, like below you. Right. But to, to actually even seek it out and, and absorb it and have that as a part of the culture. Um, and what I see is, especially as like companies become larger and larger, and this is not all the time. It's just that this is a, a problem of size as a whole, right? It's like, as you get further and further away from the people on the ground level, it makes it harder for that feedback to reach up to the top. And something I'm really fascinated by is like, how do you create those, those sort of feedback systems within organizations, right? Because if, you know, I'm the owner of Starbucks, for example, and all of my baristas are unhappy, but I have no idea that that's happening. It's like, well, those are the people who may be sort of being paid the lowest in the entire company, but they are also the ground level facing people. And if they're unhappy, if something's going wrong with them, like I want to know about it because they're the ones like doing it. How do you, how do you go about uh, giving feedback to a mentor? What would be your advice to that for somebody else who's like, I really want to say something to my leadership, but I've terrified of how to do that? Uh, well, I would ask them first if they're open to receiving feedback, because I think that's really important. Depending on like how mature they might be, it'll come across in a, in a multitude of different ways. Like I might start by saying how much, like how, how amazing they, I think that they've done and like highlight some of the results, like depending on what style of leadership that they have, like that would kind of be adjusted, you know, but if, Maybe like, cause I would highlight the things that I know mean a lot to them, right? Like I'm a, I'm a certain type of leader and results are like my thing. So if someone said to me like, wow, you've created X, Y, and Z, and then they also maybe sandwiched it with like, this is what I could see that could be improved upon. Um, but I'm, I'm very direct and I usually just get it out immediately when I see it because it's always hmm. easier for me. So like yeah. I might pull somebody aside, like if like, let's say, I don't know, somebody was super angry and like got like over the top, I might wait. But like, mm -hmm. other than that, if there's like a specific process that's not working, like I'll say it immediately. I don't have any weirdness. And to be honest, I don't want to be in a place that makes me feel bad for giving feedback. I never want to mm -hmm. be in a setting like that. Like I'm very grateful yeah. right now because anytime I give feedback, you know, like they're like, thank you so much. And I, yeah. I want to always stay in an environment. Like I always give anonymous feedback surveys. That's how I survey like my, the LA SOM community that I, mm. that I still, you know, do stuff with. Yeah. You know, the community is very large. And so it was like, well, what do you guys want to learn about? What can we improve? Like, what would you like to see more of? There's, there's so much. And I think a lot of people would be afraid to give a feedback survey to 200 people where they can say whatever to you, but like yeah. moving past the fear, what if somebody says something that will hurt me? And into I'll get really raw feedback. Maybe people would be uncomfortable telling to my face, like that's money right there. And honestly, no one's ever said anything mean to me. If you're watching this and you're in the LA Psalm community, if I ever send another anonymous survey, say something fucking mean to me. Say you're a huge bitch or something, like because I deserve it. <laughs> 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 They're like, no, she's tracking our IP address somehow within the channel. I'm really not. <laughs> that's so funny. When when receiving feedback, how 
have you always been able to handle that very well yourself or is that something no. again, you've developed? Okay. How, no. So how did you, how did you get better at taking feedback and not getting defensive, not getting um, emotional or worked up about it? And then, you know, take this wherever you want, but like, how would, how do you also sort between that's that person's feedback and that's just not what's actually effective or valuable? I think it's really clear what the come from is, right? When you're listening to somebody, like, is their intention to support, even if they're like angry or, you know, like emotional, yeah. regardless yeah. of what they look like, like what is deep down, like if I can tell it's, you know, someone who is just saying it to be mean, or maybe they felt jaded about something else or like, you know, whatever, then it just rolls off. And like, I can't even think of an example right now because I, I, I don't even remember like anything that somebody has said to me that like hasn't landed. Cause I think, right. You remember the feedback that, that the, the feedback that hurts that you remember is the stuff that you get, get to work on. Right. Um, and that, that's really, that's really the, the, the painful stuff that maybe you don't want to deal with. I was not always good at accepting feedback. No, but as you know, it's like reframing feedback again in those workshops that we did um, separately, but feel like it was together, you know, reframing feedback as something that is positive and saying, wow, what a gift this person is giving me. How incredible that they have the courage to share with me how they actually feel. What a gift that is. And thanking them, regardless of if it doesn't look like how you maybe wanted it to, or it doesn't align with the image that you had of your relationship. You know, I had um, uh, someone who worked with me who I respected immensely, immensely. And they came up to me and they were like, hey, like, you know, I just feel like, you know, sometimes, you know, you're disrespectful, right? And maybe something I was trying to say as a joke, like didn't land. And I thanked them. Like, I, I felt so terrible that I made them feel that way. And I was so appreciative that they gave me the feedback so that I could correct it, you know, and, and, you know, I guess my intention wasn't coming across to them and I thought it was being jovial. Right. But it wasn't being taken that way. And I was like, okay, amazing. Like then I can adjust for maybe other people that I don't know super, super well. Right. You know, I think as a leader, you're always going to mess things up every once in a while and it's your job to fix it. Like you're going to do something that's going to upset somebody. And sometimes everyone's going to hate you all at the same time. And that's okay. And that's, that's just, it is what it is. It's like, if, if you're going to be, if you're not going to listen to your people, the people that are working with you or the people that are around you, and if you're not going to give them what they're asking for, because you see a bigger vision, you have to enroll them into that vision or be okay with everybody being angry at you. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. If you're not willing to do the work to get them to understand, or they're not going to understand regardless of what it is, and they're just, they don't like change, you know, it's okay. And you just get to deal with it. And people always move on, mm. you know, yeah, they always yeah. move on. Is there, is there an example that you can think of? Um, you can be as specific or general as you need to be, but where you, you had a vision, like you mentioned for something and you, you know, you're getting maybe this swath of, of negative feedback and you're like, no, I just got to like enroll them into this moment. Like, what was that like for you? Can you think of a moment where, where you did that and what, what that experience was like? Um, where somebody like wasn't enrolled. Yeah. Well, cause at least what I heard from you was basically like, there are, there are moments where you have a vision as a leader, right. And that you at, the, at those times, sometimes people can really be upset at you for oh. this vision that you're creating. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, like when someone was late and no call, no show to my master classes that were free. Okay. Mm -hmm. They were like free or, and I put these on and everybody had to reserve their seats. And my request from everybody is show up, be your word, be on time. And if you can't come cancel, that's very simple. And this person like continued to no call, no show. And it was like very high profile events where like we could have had more people who wanted to learn, right? We mm -hmm. had a wait list and I actually kicked them out. I just for temporarily, it was like, it was like a, for four weeks, like we're going to pause you know, so that we can just mm -hmm. so that they know I was serious. And uh, they were very angry and upset. And they talked shit about me to everybody. And actually, there were so many people that joined my group because I held that person accountable. 
great. <laughs> they were like, yeah, I heard this person saying how horrible you are for like making you show up and, and, and making people show up and be their word. And that's what attracted me to your group because you actually take yeah. it seriously. And I was like, yeah. wow. Right. And it's, it's amazing. And actually mm -hmm. that person came back into my group and was joint and doing events for the last few years, you know? Yeah. It's all yeah. good. Like, you know, people move on <laughs> or they don't and they're just harboring this anger towards me and I have no idea, but it doesn't, it's not something I think about on a daily yeah. basis. <laughs> cool. Thanks for sharing that. So you have been, or when we first met, we were, we were at Spago, which was in Beverly Hills, uh, Wolfgang Puck's flagship restaurant. And uh, then obviously COVID happened. And now you have found yourself as the running the wine program at the Lila in Las Vegas, which um, if you follow Christy on Instagram, you'll see here constantly popping these crazy wine bottles in this, you know, absolutely fantastic restaurant that I got the pleasure to to eat at. Uh, what has that experience been like for you going from LA to Vegas and just being in this sort of, in a lot of ways, like the center of center of the world out there in Las Vegas at Delilah? Well, I didn't, I wasn't looking for a job at the time. I had actually transitioned to the courses and some other entrepreneurial things like influencer stuff that was paying my bills. And I was actually doing fine. And I was like, okay, well, that's like the end of my restaurant career. Like here I am, you know? And then I got a call from uh, one of my very dear friends who's a supplier, uh, meaning they work for a big brand and they had recommended me for this job. And I was like, Haha, no, 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 I don't want to do that. And then they were forceful and they were like, they put me in an email with uh, the executive wine director of the property because they thought that I was the perfect fit and they were having a really hard time finding someone who had like the fine dining experience, but was also like very down to earth. Like H Wood Group is a restaurant group that's based in LA. So they have like amazing nightlife venues, like the places, like their venues were the ones that I used to go to when I was 21. And like, I wanted to go to like the coolest venues, like they, that was it. And they have this amazing ability to like stay cool and relevant. And they have, you know, tons of celebrities that like go to their venues and it's always like really cool. But then combining with the wins, like very uh, prestigious, like, you know, long standing history, like just very just just wonderful in every way like the win is so incredibly detailed and they care so much about the employees and like just the way that they operate it's like a very tight ship so, and they have you know very very wealthy people that go there so combining this like fine dining but nightclub-ish aspect that doesn't go until five in the morning but will go like pretty late it's it's almost like a nightclub for adults, but with like super fine and rare wine. So like I bring in the craziest stuff and it goes out like without any issue. And, you know, we're, you know, we're doing more wine than the nightclubs, which is crazy when you think about, you know, all of the, the, the wine and stuff that they're doing like champagne yeah. bottles and stuff, but like we're doing as much champagne as we do. We're doing the same amount of fine and rare Bordeaux and Burgundy combined. Right. And it's, it's really wild to think about. And, you know, we had Justin Bieber like do a, entire concert like our opening weekend and like you know the weekend had his birthday there i mean it's it's honestly really crazy and i wish i knew sports people because they come in all the time and like people are always so excited i have no idea who they are i'm like yeah send me in there because i don't make a difference to me but uh you know it, it's been a really wonderful experience and you know i i never knew that i could do it and i didn't know i mean we go th we we do a lot more than Spago Beverly Hills. Spago Beverly Hills had an incredible inventory. It's like this giant museum almost of all the stuff. Whereas like in Vegas, as soon as you buy it, you sell it. So like I'll, I had an 85 Sasikaya. We sold it within two weeks. You know, we have 61 Lafitte. It was sold in like two weeks, right? And it's sure just like, how, how does this even happen? It's like a vacuum for high-end wine, but you have the most, you know, wealthy and influential people that go to Vegas once or twice a year, right? I mean, there's always like a conference or there's something going on. I mean, just the most diverse amount of conferences I've ever seen. Like, did you know that World of Concrete is a thing? And all I the different not. concrete <laughs> industries, I had no idea. Huge convention that just happened mm, here. Wow. SHOT Show, which is like the, the arms dealers and stuff. Like, I mean, every 
industry wow. that you can think of, there's a, there's a convention in Vegas and wow. it's so cool to see such a diverse and dynamic, like group of people, you know, coming through all the time. And then also yeah. just people going to spend a bunch of money. I think like when people go to Vegas, they expect to spend money. Mm. At least if you're, if you're planning correctly, yeah. like you should, you know, know. And, and you know, it, it really rules the city. It's, it's, mm. it's amazing. And um, I never thought that I would take this job. And I, I actually hadn't seen the room. If you haven't been to Delilah, it is the most beautiful space I've ever been in my whole life. It's It costs like $24 million. It's Jesus. so beautiful. And I had never even seen the room before I moved. And that was so crazy to like walk in and experience the gorgeousness of the venue. Like I was, I, I couldn't breathe. That's how beautiful it was. Like, especially during the day too, that, you know, guests don't get to see because we're open in the evenings, but the, the, the how, how everything shimmers and the marbling outside has sparkles in it. And it was just like, so overwhelming. I just, it was crazy. And I'm super grateful to run the wine program. I think it's, it's a lot of fun. My team is amazing. Uh, they're incredible. One of my Psalms, he worked at 11 Madison Park in the modern as the head Psalm. You know, and that's like, in New York, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like it's super high end restaurants. Like he's been a wine director since I was in ninth grade, and he just wants to like pop bottles and make a ton of money, and and mm. we all help each other. And you know, I don't, I'm not like their manager in any sense. Like they teach me more than I teach them, but I'm mm. really good at the computer stuff and all the admin and doing mm. all the annoying stuff that they don't want to do. You know, <laughs> and so Alex. I have all. Like every single, like the average age of my sommelier team is like 42 and without me, without me. And I'm 28 and have been doing this the least amount of time of all of them. Um, but they are incredible. They're like assassins. Like one of uh, the guys that works with me, his name's Georgie and he's like Bulgarian and his wife actually won the lottery to come to America. Wow. And he, and it, they were boyfriend and girlfriend. And so they had two weeks to decide whether or not they were going to get married. And he married her and they have wow. like a bunch of kids now. It's so cool. So he has this like Bulgarian accent. He looks like a spy, like just like very, like his, his suits are like slim fit and like perfect. And Georgie just walks up to this table and like, he just sells like $10,000 bottles to them. And I'm like, how? Nice. Like how? You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I don't know if it's the accent or it's like everything, but he was at Robichon for like eight years, which is like the really, really nice uh, restaurant uh, that's owned by MGM. And so he was there for eight years. And then Frank was at L'Atelier and he was at Wally's working with like tons, tons and tons of different wines. Um, but they've all like run programs and, you know, been like in my spot. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? All right. I said that lost connection for a second. Okay. They've all been in my shoes before. And so they know how things should be done. And and it's wonderful mm. to have a team of leaders. And, you know, I love that they're all way better than me. And mm. I just like bring the ammo. That's kind of how I feel. I'm like the little person that's like running with the little cart back yeah. and forth. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit more? I would love to hear. Um, I know that was a vague question. Um, I would love to hear you talk more about uh, the importance of leading from the bottom, because I think so often people think of leadership as like, oh, that's my boss. That is the leader, right? There's that person up there. And I think something that you've done so well, and I think both of us would agree is so important. It's like, regardless of where you are, right? It's, it's leadership is sort of like a way of being. It's a way that you act and how you, how you live, how you go about your job. And it's key, regardless of like sort of your status in the hierarchy where you're at. So what is your question? <laughs> so my question is like, yeah, I would love, what, what is my question? I think I just answered it for myself. But um, my question is for people who are, I would say employees who are not at some sort of a quote unquote leadership level, what would be your recommendation to them for our, like leading from the bottom? Well, I believe we're always managing up right? We're always managing up. So it's like whenever you're talking to your peers or people who can't do anything to fix problems, you're just bitching. So we're always managing up. It's like, are we, uh, are we, you know, griping up? <laughs> are we, you know, uh, communicating? I love 
when people give feedback, I think that's like the most important thing for me is having people around that are not afraid to stand up to you and tell you what they think or when they think I'm wrong. And, um, and also like my way of being is to adjust if they're right. Right. I mean, there's a lot of times where it's like someone had a better idea and it's like, okay, let's do it that way. Great. You know, and like, that's the type of environment that I want to be in. And, you know, not, you know, there's a lot of teams that don't operate that way, right? Where you feel like uncomfortable, you know, sharing, uh, or, or, and it might just be a you problem, maybe they would take it just fine, but you made up in your head that they wouldn't be okay with it. But I would say, test the waters and give some feedback, give feedback often, regularly, you know, and encourage that and say, thank you. And I think as, you know, a leader, you know, really listening to them and, and fighting for their needs. Um, when they have them, which aren't very, it's not very often that they like really need something, right? And um, doing everything that you can and going anywhere and everywhere to make it possible, and, like banging down doors and finding out rules and all that stuff. It's just like showing the effort that that you care and that you value them. I think that's, you know, what creates an actual team and not just like a boss and employees, right? I mean, you want to be in an environment where everyone feels like they matter and they have a contribution in your space and that that they are that they're worthy right yeah. and yeah. and you know as a, a a a person who is a lot younger than my team like i listen to them for everything and you know they guide me on every decision that i make i tell all the distributors like sorry i have to I discuss with my team before making any commitments, right? Because they matter and what they want to sell and what they want to do and how they want things structured. There's certain things that like, I I have a vision of something, like I want to carry a certain wine because it's a very popular one. Maybe they don't want to sell it because, or they don't want to have it available because they think that, you know, they'll just order something else or whatever. Like we have small we have not, they're not even like disagreements. They're just like different philosophies. Like everybody has a different philosophy on how a wine list should be structured. And I have my vision and however they want to fit into that. I'm very flexible with the vision, but there's certain things where I'm like, this is the way I think that we should do it. And, you know, I'm glad that I did because, uh, you know, I stuck to my guns when I moved here and I, you know, put the racks up and put this, you know, created the entire organization and how it works and like had to convince people in the hotel to work extra hours, you know, just to make my stuff possible. And we did. And now we're like a rocket ship. I mean, it's like, it's uh, the organization system is what I'm like most proud of. And, and, you know, most people think like being a SOM is like running around on the floor. And like, that's a lot of being a SOM. But uh, for me, it's just inventory management. And it's like, how do you, how do you manage a dynamic inventory when you're getting deliveries of the wrong wine? Um, When you're getting, how do you, you know, when you're getting 25 wine orders in the span of 10 minutes, like what's the process? What's that look like? And, um, you know, I created a process that was very similar to Spago, but I think upgraded to, for our needs specifically. And, um, and, you know, I'm able to find a wine in less than 30 seconds and bring it out. Like that's how fast we can pull out a bottle of wine. And like, that's been a huge key to our success. And, and so it's like those things I'm really firm about, like the organization system, like the process of how we do things in in that regard. But in terms of the contents of like, what we're bringing on, like selling and stuff, like totally flexible. And, you know, I think we all want to be part of like building something together. And I think it's much more meaningful and enriching to, to do it side by side instead of like one person talking down to everybody, like I, I would be the worst situation for me to be in. I would hate yeah. that to me, yeah. just like barking orders at people and telling them what to do. Oh, that sounds awful. Like, I want to like, Hey, like, let's focus on you. Like um, one of our Psalms uh, was taking the master Psalm exam. And so uh, we printed out like a thousand of his flashcards and it was the answer and the question on the same side. And so like in service, like while he's like decanting a wine, like we would whisper in his ear, like, what's the minimum must weight of Pinot Gris and all sauce or something like, like we would, we would like whisper these like very high level wine questions that honestly like meant nothing to me. Cause like, I don't use any of that esoteric information, but it was like, but it mattered to him. And like, those are some fun things. I don't know that we, 
that I like to do is ask them like, Hey, what do you want to do in five years? Like, what do you, what do you want to learn about? Like, do you want to take over this? Like, how can I support you with this? Like, you know, letting people like own their space and like not micromanaging what they do. Like, like Georgie, my Bulgarian Psalm, who's so handsome and amazing. I fucking love him. He's great. <laughs> it's just, but he's like so organized and methodical about everything that he does. And he took over the events. So like, you know, we're, we have to order, you know, tons of cases for these events on these specific days. And like, there's always new events coming up. So it's like, you have to be really on top of it. And after like one week, I like never looked at another event email again, because he's like so on top of it. And I think it's just like when you leave people alone and let people do their thing, like they just own it. And now we're like, our event business is like, so, so it it just like crushes it because he like really owns it. And I love to see that. And that makes me excited, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> makes yeah. me Cause I used to, I used to get to do it at the beginning and it was all by myself and like what a shitty job I did, you know, in mm. comparison where he's like tailoring each one to each client and like utilizing things that we need to focus on or we have a lot of, right. Like just having a point person, like just doing that. It's almost like an artistic way of doing mm. things. Right. I think there's, yeah. there's always like a bit of artistry and, in, in um, in organizations and actually that's one of the wins Mm -hmm. core like it's one of their the ways of being that they want you to do it's like being artistic in whatever way whether it's like you know folding um you know folding a towel if you're in housekeeping or you know managing a wine list or whatever there's the sort of artistry to everything Mm -hmm. that we do that's really cool yeah i was that was going to be um the question i want to jump into anyway that you you had mentioned that the win and it sounds like this really has sort of trickled down into you. And you've always led with a lot of leadership and, and heart and, and that kind of thing. And you can tell with the type of the team that you've built and the way that you all interact. And you said that feeling of of feeling cared for both for yourself, but how your team feels and that everybody feels a part of it. Like I loved when you said that, you know, when sort of a, a producer comes to you with a, a decision, like you're going to go back to your team. Right, and bring them to the the fold, and that's key because ultimately all all of them are are selling the wine as much, if not more, than you are. Right, so actually being like, hey, yeah, what do you guys actually think? Which is something that often is so missed. Um, and I'm really curious because you mentioned how good the wine, or the wine, the wins culture is, and they are a large organization. Like that is not a small hotel a lot of places can't create a good culture within uh, a restaurant, much or less, you know, thousands and thousands of people that are leading over across like multiple hotels and um, restaurants and businesses, et cetera. Like in your experience, what are the things that the win is doing right? That helps that, that really trickle down from the top all the way down to, to you guys. Okay. I'm going to tell the story. So uh, we had a, a new president. This was last year. And he started sending what he called a we shift. It's like a pre-shift. Like before you go into service in a restaurant, you'll get a pre-shift with like the managers and you talk about like important things or whatever the focus is for that day. And uh, this new president that started uh, sent a daily we shift email to everyone that has a win uh, email address. And he would talk about different concepts you know, having fun at work, like, are you having fun at work? Like, what are you doing uh, to to make your environment better? You know, see something, say something. Um, he would talk about like, your own personal fulfillment and joy and just like a lot of uh, emotionally intelligent pieces of information that I never saw being discussed in the workplace ever. Mm. I mean, he was talking about like, you know, are you choosing to be happy today? Like, you know, it's mm. your choice. Like, go out. And it was like a long message that you can tell that he wrote it personally. And so wow. after like a week or two, I actually responded to him. And <laughs> I said, thank you so much for doing these. Like, this is so wonderful. I hope, you know, just thank you for this. It's, it's really wonderful. I hope to meet you soon. And he responded. He sends this email to like 10,000 people. Yeah. He responded in like five minutes. And he said, Hi, Christy, I would love to come meet you uh, sometime soon. And then he came to my restaurant (laughs) that day. And my managers are like, the president, Mr. Goldbrands is asking for you. (laughs) And so I like run over and he's like, Hi, Christy, I wanted to like come meet you. I was like, 
what? Like I was like <laughs> shocked. Like, I was so confused. And then, and then get this. And then a week later he comes back and was like, Christy, I saw that amazing article where they featured you in Las Vegas weekly. I had no idea about your charity. I would love to connect you with Monica. Who's like our head of uh, charitable giving and stuff. And they, they supported me in getting my charity as one of our, the, the, the partners that and you have to go through like a global compliance check. It took like 16 wow. weeks Jeez. and he supported me in doing that. Like I, I knew that it was a thing, but it was really cool to get like a personal invitation. Like, Oh, we'd love yeah. for your charity to, to be a partner with the win so that, you know, they can do an employee match. They actually do $50,000 a year employee match. Yeah. So if I donated X amount to the charity Amazing. or to, uh, they would match it essentially, which wow. is like really cool. Yeah. That's amazing. And yeah. And so, um, you know, that, so that was just like one example. I think, you know, obviously choosing people who care and, and, you know, creating an environment in which like the, the superstars are acknowledged like they have this like stars program that's really cool and like they put you up on like a billboard at work for like you know it's like rotating for like an entire like month so people like see your face on screen on this like camera and stuff and people like come up to you and recognize you as like a star like oh, you know they so really funny. do a lot to like acknowledge their employees they actually this year they gave everyone a gift and a 200 dollars gift card every single employee and because I was like, what is everybody talking about? And they're like, oh, yeah, like, go pick up your gift for the holidays. I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah. And um, but it's not even just that. I mean, it's just like the the way that the way that they care about everybody. Like, it's just in the it's like everyone that I work with, all the executives are like so kind and like open to feedback, open to suggestions. Like everyone is is really positive. And it's an awesome place. And, you know, I was not used to working in a super corporate environment, but, you know, I learned that being in a corporate environment could also be fun, you know, and you, you don't have to be, and there's definitely executives who are not like quiet wallflowers, right? It's like seeing people that are just as loud and obnoxious as I am sometimes <laughs> and seeing how they can also succeed was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And, you know, um, I've also learned a lot of patience because, sometimes things just don't move as fast, right? In like big organizations. So like, you know, expanding our cellar took almost nine months total, right? And it's like, we built a whole another cellar and added a library ladder, did all this stuff. But it just takes a long time because you have all these different departments that you got to coordinate with, you know what I mean? And um, it's very, just very different. But, you know, they've always supported everything that I've ever needed. And that's what made my program successful. So, awesome. I mean, it seems like they care, you yeah. know? Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, that has been <laughs> And like for the, the president like... to like come and meet me. Yeah. I was, I was shocked. I literally like cried later. I, uh, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm a big crier. It was amazing. Yeah. It was so wonderful that somebody like actually listened at the mm -hmm. very top and like responded. I can't yeah. even respond to emails in like five minutes. That's, that's, and I'm like, wow, I aspire to be like that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I find that. I've seen that to be fairly true with a lot of really um, high end people that I've met is like a lot of times they are just way better at responding to texts and emails than I would have ever imagined. I'm like, I'm really bad at this. How are you responding back to me this quickly? It's pretty funny. Uh, I guess as a kind of, a, as we're nearing the end of the podcast, I'm, I'm curious uh, with the win, you mentioned the sort of, uh, what was the value? Like do everything as artistry or do you have it, have everything be art oh yeah it's it's like doing everything with like a sense of artistry it's like yeah do. it's not like art it's, it's yeah the doing everything with you... a sense of artistry mm -hmm. yeah are there any other values that you see the wind has that is maybe unique to them or maybe it's not but that's something that they they really embody that allows the the wind to be effective in the way that it is yeah, I mean, I don't think this is one of their core values, but just being innovative. I mean, they're mm -hmm. always open to changing. They're always renovating things and, and switching things up. And, and they're not afraid to change something. And mm -hmm. that's what I really appreciate because no matter what, you know, they're, you know, open to doing the work to make something better. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate that 
about everything that they do. Um, it's really wonderful to work there. Awesome. Well, Christy, this was like so, so, so much fun. I'm really glad we got to chat and uh, dive into some like just fun, fun topics for, for both of us. I hope you had fun as well. Thank you for having me. I love yeah. you, Cameron. I love you too. Where can, uh, where can people find out more about you? On Instagram, Christy Norman underscore Psalm. Um, I'm sure Cameron will link it or <laughs> we will. I don't really use Twitter. Don't you really use Facebook? So Instagram's really the best spot or the online wine course.com. You can watch my you can take my wine course and learn about wine. Yep. Which is a great, great beginner. If you want to get into the wine industry, if you're just curious about wine, it's a great, great place to go. So awesome. Christy, thank you so much. I'll uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Cameron.